Now the system is trying to keep you engaged by pushing you more stuff that's aligned with your political interests. And if you're a person who's already on the extreme, the only step to go is further extreme. Polarization is nothing new in American politics. What is new is how deep and pervasive the divisions have become. A new study from UC Davis finds that the artificial intelligence algorithms used by social media platforms can play a role in fostering extremist views and political radicalization. Platforms, including YouTube and TikTok, use those algorithms to recommend more content to users based on what they've already seen. This is The Backdrop, a UC Davis podcast exploring the world of ideas. I'm Satirius Johnson. How big a factor are these algorithms, and what, if anything, can be done to help people keep a broader perspective? Computer science PhD student Mohammed Haroun led the study on those AI algorithms. Welcome to The Backdrop, Haroun. Hi, Soterios. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. So let's dive right into the study. Um, what exactly did you find, and how did you go about it? Yeah, so the study we conducted was primarily on YouTube, but I do a lot of research on recommendation systems and their algorithms in general. This particular research, we were interested in the question of online radicalization via YouTube recommendations. And there has been prior anecdotal evidence to show that some people have been led into these rabbit holes of polarization and radicalization. But in this particular research, we wanted to tease apart the role of users and recommendations from the platform itself. Right. So how did you define radicalization for the purpose of this study? So in this study, we defined radicalization as the content that was basically recommended on YouTube, who are the people tweeting about that content on Twitter? And we define tweets on Twitter about a particular video as its level of slant towards a particular political ideology. If a video was tweeted only by Republican audiences, we would conclude that this is a video that's popular with people who have Republican ideologies. And the same goes for people who hold Democrat ideologies. We define radicalization particularly as the movement from content that was shared by a mixture of Republican and liberal users to content that was primarily shared by one side of the spectrum. So these are people who are self-identifying as either Republican or or Democratic or one way or the other. We did not have self-identification from these users. We were looking at basically who they were following on Twitter. So if you're a person who tweets a particular video and we look at your we look at the list of accounts that you're following it gives us an idea based on if you're only following Republican accounts such as Candace Owens or Sean Hannity or some particular well-known person that has been involved with the Republican identity. That gives us a pretty good idea of what your political leanings are. Right. Okay. So how did you how did you uh, conduct the study? So the study was purely systematic. We did not rely on actual users because prior research a lot of people have dealt with either two things. They've either looked at real user watch histories or they've either looked at what the general recommendations on YouTube are. We want to do an assessment of just what the algorithmic recommendations are without any user volition. And we ran the study by training several hundred thousand sock puppets, which are basically fake user accounts that browse the content on YouTube, watch videos, go from recommendation to recommendation. And we tried to identify, like, based on what we were having these accounts watch, what were the recommendations generated from the system? So these sock puppets, are they they like bots or something like that? You could call them as bots. They were not actual Google or YouTube accounts. They were just random browser sessions that were in parallel interacting with the platform, watching videos for a set amount of time, and just practically crawling through the entire interface of YouTube. So it's almost like you had a cohort of like, what, thousands of kind of virtual people going through seeing what these algorithms on these platforms, where they would direct these these sock puppets. Exactly. And this was different from prior research because we were interested only, again, in just what the algorithm is doing for us. But here we could actually control what we're actually doing on the platform. So all these sock puppets, we had them set to watching a bunch of videos that we had pre-identified as either far left leaning, far right leaning, left, moderate, center, just right. And this taxonomy of whatever ideologies we had identified for YouTube channels and the videos from those channels, we were able to tell what the recommendations for a user who was only a particular ideology were on the platform on any given day. Did you kind of quantify the bias of these various videos in some way, or did you just have this far right, far left description? 
these these categorizations were built on top of our underlying quantification of whatever the bias were in these videos. That quantification was based on, again, who was tweeting about that video. So if a video was tweeted by 50% Republicans and 50% liberals, we would say that this video has a slant of zero. But if a video was only tweeted by people who had ideologies that were Republican leaning, this would indicate the video has a score of one and vice versa, minus one for liberal or Democrat accounts. Okay, so what exactly did you find? The overall study lasted several months, but if you only look at a particular sock puppet, uh, its life was a little under two hours, where it spent one hour watching 100 videos on YouTube for 30 to 40 seconds, and then a couple of minutes just trying to look at what the homepage for those sock puppets were, and then a couple of minutes just to look at what the recommendations in the up next autoplay feature of YouTube were. Do those recommendations change depending upon how long you were watching a video? There have been some studies that showed what watching what duration of the video leads to what effect on the recommendations. And in one study, someone identified that it's like 22 or 23 seconds, at which point where you realize that YouTube registers that a view has been made for this video. Basically, the increment in the view counts for that video happens around like the 20 to 30 second mark, which is where we ended up with the 30 to 40 second watch time for our sock puppet experiment. Right. So what did you conclude in the end? So you concluded in the end that we had three tests overall that we wanted to look at. The first one was, do these sock puppets exhibit ideological bias in their recommendations after we have trained them on this particular watch history? And that basically showed that based on the user's prior exposure to whatever content they are inclined with politically, it actually led to a statistically significant difference in what their recommendations on the homepage were. So if you're a user who watches far left or left or even center content, your recommendations on the homepage generally reflect that ideology of yours. And that led us to conclude that there is indeed some ideological bias in the recommendations just based on your prior watch histories. But that's not the key question of radicalization that we were trying to answer. That question was that if you continue to watch the recommendations from the system after you've built this watch history of prior exposure, do these recommendations gradually become more radical, i.e. do they move from your current political leaning to a one that's more extreme or polarizing? And our findings dictated that if you started off from videos that were at a score of a slant of minus 0.7, which is still is pretty high, just following the recommendations without any user volition led you to videos that were at a score of minus 0.78. And similarly for the right-leaning sock puppets, the score went from plus 0.7 to plus 0.8, which indicates that you move from a video that was primarily a mixture of some Democrat and Republican audiences to a video that had a higher degree of just Republican audiences. So either way, I mean, the the algorithm kind of figures out where you're at and it kind of pulls you a little further to that side in the stuff it recommends to you. Right. I think this has to do with what the algorithm is trying to optimize for here. So recommendation systems, their main purpose is to maximize user engagement, right? Right. And with user engagement, it involves showing people more of what they like. And that's all fine if you're just watching innocuous content, for example, cat videos or (laughs) cooking videos. Like it would recommend you more and more of cat or cooking videos. But if you're a person who's watching political videos instead, that's where this becomes problematic because now the system is trying to keep you engaged by pushing you more stuff that's aligned with your political interests. And if you're a person who's already on the extreme, the only step or the only way to go is further extreme. So you're basically recommending as a way to help people not become politically radicalized on these social media platforms is to kind of change the algorithm so that it doesn't pull them toward, you know, the far extreme, but somehow mixes in content that is more, I guess, in the middle. Right. Another aspect of this is content that is diverse. We want people to experience both sides of the spectrum. I would imagine that, uh, you know, as you said, I mean, social media companies, they they create these algorithms to keep people engaged so that they can, you know, sell eyeballs, sell the attention spans of people to companies that advertise. 
So uh, I would imagine that they wouldn't be very willing to change the algorithm. Is is the, have you even approached or has has have have there been any discussions with these companies about changing the algorithm and how willing might they be to do that? At one of the conferences that I attended earlier this year, I was actually eating lunch with someone who at that moment I did not know was actually from YouTube. <laughs> So he was talking to me about my research and asking questions about what I found and stuff like that and recommendations. And then at the end, he told me that he actually works at YouTube. <laughs> so that was a very interesting scenario that I recently experienced. But I think the consensus that I determined from my conversation with him was, and this is something that's a recurring issue, I believe, in a lot of these deep learning models that are being used to train recommendation systems online. It's just that all of these are black boxes to even the developers. Like they are all data driven. They get in some data from the users who use the platform and based on that make decisions about what recommendations to show to other users. So I think the issue here is not that these companies are either willingly creating systems that are radicalizing users. It's just how the model of that data driven machine learning model is that's making these decisions based on what data it has seen coming from other users. That black box nature of the system itself leads to these issues. These are AI algorithms. So it almost sounds like they set it and it evolves on its own. At one point, you almost don't even have control over it anymore. Is that, am I, is that accurate at all? Yes, you could say that. Like A lot of studies have been performed on actual production systems determining what biases that they possess. So a lot of loan-based systems have issues targeting minorities. And this kind of stuff comes in, again, from the data-driven nature of the platform or the system itself. Do you think that it's that these algorithms speed up the process of radicalization or, or, or do they just make this extreme content more accessible? It could be argued that this content generally already existed on the platforms themselves and that the system actually brings these videos to light based on whatever the user's watch history is. So I guess you could say that both things are simultaneously true. Mm -hmm. There is this interesting research that was performed recently on YouTube talking about the supply and demand of the problematic content on the platform where they talked about that because some users crave this kind of content, creating that demand for the content, it inadvertently leads to a bunch of content creators who are coming in to fill in that supply for that content itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did you find that this this potential radicalization was more prominent on either side of the political spectrum? So we identified that both sides of the spectrum, left and right, experienced this push towards the extreme to similar extents. But when we tried to de-radicalize the users by manipulating their recommendations, that part was much harder for the right-leaning users. And by users, you're talking about the sock puppets. The sock puppets, right, yes. So so how how exactly did you try to manipulate it to to de-radicalize them? So the de-radicalization was part of a principled approach that we were trying to develop, which was to inject into the user's watch history videos of a variety of different types. We tried to include videos in the moderate, category that we had, videos in the left category for the right users. And we developed this principal system, which would look at your current set of homepage recommendations and decide based on the bias it was seeing existing currently over there, Hmm. which video to inject, which would optimally reduce that bias on the homepage. So this would just identify that video and then watch that video for the user in a background tab. For example, if you're a right-leaning user, this would identify that if I watched a left-leaning video, your algorithm or your recommendations would change in a certain way. So that's that's pretty fascinating. So so you were going in and you were you were manipulating the sock puppet to instead of just following the recommendation that the algorithm would give it, you would actually make it play, say, a more left-leaning video, but the algorithm kept on dragging it towards the right. Whereas the same thing didn't happen when you did the manipulation to the left-leaning sock puppet, right? Right, that would be a good way of saying this. But one of the things that we noticed was that you had already established yourself as a person who is right-leaning. And in that case, watching a bunch of left-leaning videos did not remove that bias that the system had already created for you as a right-leaning user. Right. But I thought you, you were kind of saying that 
when you did the same manipulation to the left-leaning sock puppets and you, you injected watching some right-leaning videos, the algorithm wasn't as resistant still pulling the left-leaning sock puppet further to the left. Yes, for the left-leaning user, we were able to move them towards the moderate category much easily than we were for the right-leaning sock puppet. That's that's interesting. So those algorithms somehow are, again, AI, so they kind of evolved on their own. So what do you think is behind that? We can't really comment on what exactly the reasons are Again, these are all black boxes to not just us, but actually the developers of the systems themselves. (laughs) So you can't really comment on what exactly the issue is. But I think one of the major differences between left and right leaning content is the abundance of right content compared to left content. So there are a lot more channels that appear or appeal to right leaning category than they are for the left leaning users. Mm -hmm. So all those channels about the intellectual dark web, for example, Ben Shapiro, uh, Sean Hannity, all those people that fall in that category generally identify as right-leaning users. So they all end up falling into the same category as what we would identify as a right-leaning user. Yeah. So it might just be that the the sheer quantity of the right-leaning content just makes it easier to kind of stay on that side of the spectrum as a user being drawn into it. Right. You could say that the supply for the right content far outweighs the supply for the left content. Interesting. So now I I understand you are still running some of these sock puppets. uh, So you're still collecting data every day uh, for months on end here. Um, Did you notice any changes in the recommendations during the the run-up to the midterm elections? Not for the midterms specifically, because a lot of these platforms, I realized, even TikTok and especially, they made some changes to the platform leading up to the midterms. So I'm curious if one of those changes involved decreasing recommendations for midterm related content. But I do have another interesting anecdote that I observed, which was around the time of the shooting in Texas. Mm-hmm. Around that time, I was looking at what the recommendations after the shooting were for the right and left users. And over there, I noticed that for the left users, while we were particularly seeing recommendations about content related to gun reform or criticism on law enforcement, the recommendations for the right were more about healing and recovering after the fact and less about actual criticism on gun laws or gun reform and more about thoughts and prayers in general. Mm -hmm. So we could clearly see a difference in the narratives for the left and right sock puppets, which you could say translates to, if you're a right-leaning user who watches right videos, mostly like Fox News or something, you will end up seeing a completely different narrative on your homepage recommendations than users on the left. Right. And as to your question about the midterm elections, I am still crunching through the data, but I did not see some of that narrative spill over there in that particular topic. But I'm curious if like they made specific changes to the algorithm that made it the case. So Another interesting thing that I noticed was when we first started this experiment, this was, I believe, sometime early 2021, we were seeing much higher degrees of radicalization than we do currently with the amount of data that we have now. And that sort of troubled me for quite a while until I went back and looked at exactly what is happening to these sock puppets under the hood. Mm -hmm. And that's when I observed that a lot of the channels that we had initially identified as far right, so Joe Rogan's YouTube channel and a couple of other channels, they actually ended up getting banned sometime in the middle of our study. Mm. And that really drove down the radicalization values we were originally seeing for some of these sock puppets. So I guess that tends to the dynamic nature of the algorithm as well. Like it's constantly evolving. More data is coming in. Channels are getting removed. Channels are getting added. And that makes it difficult to conclude for, say, the study we conducted last year, that the findings that we had then would translate to what the platform is working as currently, which is why it makes sense to have what we're doing currently, this longitudinal analysis of how is the algorithm actually evolving over time. Now, I know you're a computer scientist, but I I know also this study, you know, you're leading this study and it's kind of an interdisciplinary approach uh, that you're that you're working with the communications department and and researchers. Do you have any recommendations for either policymakers or individuals to to mitigate the spread of, of 
you know, radicalization or extremism? I mean, what, what can a free society do without impinging on, say, free speech or freedom of thought and still try to limit the political radicalization? I think that's a question best left for the communications people in the project. <laughs> but I would say this, that the first step to that is becoming a bit more involved in what the content that you're trying to consume online is, a bit more awareness actually about like whether the content that you're watching, does it reflect the sentiments of the wider public? And just being informed about fact-checking all those regular processes about whatever information you're consuming online, be it on YouTube or Twitter or TikTok, how much truth is there to that? Yeah, so checking the source of the content you're consuming and maybe comparing it to other sources and seeing you know, if what you're seeing is could possibly really be true or not. Definitely. And a lot of the times that the content that is most problematic is somewhat partisan in nature. So it's either going to push the view that the other side is evil, basically, and just trying to perceive or like understanding the perspectives of that other side. I think it's one of the better things that can be done where you're trying to familiarize yourself with what their viewpoint is. It's okay to disagree with that point. But just being aware of and respecting what that point is and what it means to the other side, I think is one of the key things that we are currently lacking and should be promoting for regular users of the platforms. Right. I guess, you know, one of the luxuries of living in a free society is that you have access to all these different points of view. And so you shouldn't limit yourself. It's not a bad idea to at least expose yourself to what other people are thinking, not that you necessarily need to agree with them, like you were saying, or feel like, you know, you need to change your views, but just at least try to understand other perspectives. Definitely. So when you went into this, were you were you also hoping to maybe kind of develop some sort of solution? Yes. So our goal with all of this research is to come up with possible interventions to help mitigate these problems that we identified. In our research, we actually ended up creating this tool, which for now, we are just referring to a center tube whose goal was to, again, look at your recommendations on the homepage and identify which videos would optimally reduce the bias, if any, that currently exists on your homepage recommendations. And this system would then inject in your watch history a bunch of false video watches just to manipulate the algorithm into thinking that you are a user who is not as biased as others or the system would have taught you so. Mm, interesting. I mean, have, have you have you tested this tool? Yes, so this tool was built on top of our already results that we had already seen in our study regarding intervention. And we are hoping to release a version of this, at least a simpler version of this tool out there for users to use and then see what changes to the recommendations can we get this tool to make. Uh, there are some limitations to this system though that we've identified that are Something that we have no obvious answer for is that people who are already too far gone, like they are already extreme, they're the ones who need the system the most. Mm -hmm. But how are you going to convince them to install this tool and change their recommendations? And I also wonder, like, how long will it take for the AI to catch up to the tool and figure out how to work around it? <laughs> yeah, most definitely. <laughs> it's always been deemed an arms race. It's always been an escalating effort on both ends. Well, it's really great to get a scientific, quantitative handle on all this, especially as social media seems to be here to stay. Thank you so much for sharing your work, Haroon. Thank you so much for having me. Muhammad Haroon is a computer science PhD student at UC Davis. He led a study that found the artificial intelligence algorithms used by social media platforms can play a role in fostering extremist views and political radicalization. If you like this podcast, check out another UC Davis podcast, Unfold. Season 4 explores the most cutting-edge technologies and treatments that help advance the health of both people and animals. Join public radio veterans and Unfold hosts Amy Quinton and Marianne Rush Sharp as they unfold stories about the people and animals affected the most by this research. I'm Saturius Johnson, and this is The Backdrop, a UC Davis podcast exploring the world of ideas.